the pale orange dust that hung in the windless morning light grew faint, and then it too was gone. The burial stood silent and empty in the sun, as if nothing had occurred there at all. He sat and pulled on his boot and picked up the rifle and ejected the spent casing and put it in his shirt pocket and closed the bolt. Then he slung the rifle over his shoulder and set out. It took him some forty minutes to cross the burial. From there, he made his way up a long volcanic slope and followed the crest of the ridge southeast to an overlook above the country into which the animals had vanished. He glassed the terrain slowly. Crossing that ground was a large tailless dog, black in color. He watched it. It had a huge head and cropped ears, and it was limping badly. It paused and stood. It looked behind it. Then it went on. He lowered the glasses and stood watching it go. He hiked on along the ridge, with his thumb hooked in the shoulder strap of the rifle. His hat pushed back on his head. The back of his shirt was already wet with sweat. The rocks there were etched with pictographs perhaps a thousand years old. The men who drew them hunters like himself. Of them, there was no other trace. At the end of the ridge was a rock slide, a rough trail leading down. Candelilla and Scrub Cat Claw. He sat in the rocks and steadied his elbows on his knees and scanned the country with the binoculars. A mile away on the floodplain sat three vehicles. He lowered the binoculars and looked over the country at large. Then he raised them again. There looked to be men lying on the ground. He jacked his boots into the rocks and adjusted the focus. The vehicles were four-wheel drive trucks, or Broncos, with big all-terrain tires and winches and racks of roof lights. The men appeared to be dead. He lowered the glasses. Then he raised them again. Then he lowered them and just sat there. Nothing moved. He sat there for a long time. When he approached the trucks, he had the rifle unslung and cradled at his waist with the safety off. He stopped. He studied the country, and then he studied the trucks. They were all shot up. Some of the tracks of holes that ran across the sheet metal were spaced and linear, and he knew they'd been put there with automatic weapons. Most of the glass was shot out, and the tires flat. He stood there, listening. In the first vehicle, there was a man slumped dead over the wheel. Beyond were two more bodies lying in the gaunt yellow grass. Dried blood black on the ground. He stopped and listened. Nothing. The drone of flies. He walked around the end of the truck. There was a large dead dog there of the kind he'd seen crossing the floodplain. The dog was gut shot. Beyond that, was a third body lying face down. He looked through the window at the man in the truck. He was shot through the head, blood everywhere. He walked onto the second vehicle, but it was empty. He walked out to where the third body lay. There was a shotgun in the grass. The shotgun had a short barrel, and it was fitted with a pistol stock and a 20-round drum magazine. He nudged the man's boot with his toe and studied the low surrounding hills. The third vehicle was a Bronco, with a lifted suspension and dark smoked windows. He reached up and opened the driver's side door. There was a man sitting in the seat looking at him. Moss stumbled back, leveling the rifle. The man's face was bloody. He moved his lips dryly. Agua, cuate, he said. Agua, por Dios. He had a short-barreled H&K machine pistol, with a black nylon shoulder strap lying in his lap and Moss reached and got it, and stepped back. Agua, the man said. Por Dios, I ain't got no water. Agua. Moss left the door open, and slung the H&K over his shoulder, and stepped away. The man followed him with his eyes. Moss walked around the front of the truck, and opened the door on the other side. He lifted the latch, and folded the seat forward. The cargo space in the rear was covered with a metallic silver tarp. He pulled it back a load of brick-sized parcels, each wrapped in plastic. He kept one eye on the man and got out his knife and cut a slit in one of the parcels. A loose brown powder dribbled out. He wet his forefinger and dipped it in the powder and smelled it. Then he wiped his finger on his jeans and pulled the tarp back over the parcels and stepped back and looked over the country again. 
Nothing. He walked away from the truck and stood and glassed the low hills, the lava ridge, the flat country to the south. He got out his handkerchief and walked back and wiped clean everything he'd touched. The door handle and the seat latch and the tarp and the plastic package. He crossed around to the other side of the truck and wiped everything down there, too. He tried to think what else he might have touched. He went back to the first truck and opened the door with his kerchief and looked in. He opened the glove box and closed it again. He studied the dead man at the wheel. He left the door open and walked around to the driver's side. 